Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. It's Rath Hashem that the power of the, the, the Torah we're going to learn tonight should bring shalom, it should protect all our chayalei tzvah and al Israel, everyone should be protected. It's Rath Hashem that the koach of the Torah should bring all our hostages back, it should protect all of Am Israel, and maybe at the end we'll do a, we'll do a tehillim. And, uh, I don't know what's going on right now with what Netanyahu is trying to decide and not decide, but let's hope that um, Hashem is being super merciful and that we can have peace, but we should have security and we shouldn't have any, any wicked people trying to kill us at the same time. Should we shut up? Okay, let's begin. So we're calling this Star Wars. And I'll tell you why. And the fact that we're going through a war right now is a good example of this concept. This week's Pasha is, anyone know? How does the verse start? Come on, give me the first verse. Give me a verse, please. In fact, you sit there. <laughs> so, Vaishlach Yaakov Malachim Lefanav. Hashem, Jacob sent angels. The famous story is Yaakov is meeting Esau. They're about to have a big meeting. Esau's brought 400 men. He doesn't like us much. He wanted to kill Yaakov. So, Yaakov is like trying to, a little bit like probably, can you imagine if we had to go and meet the head, the head of Hamas? You know, Netanyahu was going to meet the head of Hamas. They had that meeting. Instead of Mossad going to Qatar, imagine if it was. You know, they've got to go to a tunnel and, and Netanyahu is going to meet him and it's Hamas and 400 men. So what, what does Yaakov do? Yaakov malachim lefanav. He sends angels. Let me ask you a question. Since when do we send angels? And by the way, it was literally angels. It says malachim mamash. Literal angels. They were proper angels. He sent him angels. And by the way, probably the angels were Gabriel. You should know the malach Gabriel is the angel who protects the land of Israel, who protects us. Raphael is now very, very busy trying to heal people that have been injured. Since when do we send angels? Explains the Kabbalist the following. Number one, my friends, it's worth you coming just to hear the next three minutes, even though I don't go after three minutes, but to hear this following message. Next time you've got a really important appointment, next time maybe you're going to a really important job interview, a really important date, God forbid something that's, that's, you know, go to a court case. Send angels ahead. We were allowed to send angels. That's the power of humans. That's what Hashem has given us. Sorry? Did I say you should talk to angels any? So Hashem created angels. So, so, did I say you should pray to an angel? Did the rabbi say that? I didn't say that. It says the Torah says Eli Vayishlach Yaakov Malachim Lefanav. We can summon angels to work for Hashem. We can because we need help. And says the Shla Kadosh, and this is how I want to begin tonight. And this is why it's called Star Wars. Right now, the Hamas war, what happened on Simchat Torah, wasn't a random event. It wasn't stam. You know, do you know how many times terrorists have wanted to harm us, hurt us? Why Dafka now? Because for whatever reason, which I'm not going to go into now. Up there in the heavenly worlds, it was decided. In the stars, it's decided. Says the Shlach Kadosh. Nothing happens in this world unless it's rooted in the high worlds. Again, nothing happens. If you're going to meet your soulmate, first of all, you meet them there. If you're going to get onto the chupa, first of all, you have the chupa there. Please God, we're going to build the third Bet HaMikdash. First of all, it's going to be built there. If this war is going to end up in Shalom, Bezat Hashem, we end it in Shalom and we win, it's going to be won there first. If there's going to be kind of, kind of stalemate or, or God forbid, seemingly their win, it's going to be there. Nothing happens down here if it doesn't happen up there, says the Shlach Kadosh. That's why. Vayishlach Yaakov Malachim Lefanav. Step one. What happens in this week's parasha? Three big meetings between Yaakov and Esau. Meeting number one. 
when they finally meet. And by the way, the way Yaakov prayed to meet Esav is the way that we should be preparing now for war, which is on one hand, you pray, everything comes from prayer. Number two, diplomacy. He went with gifts. He went to try and be diplomatic. On the other hand, pragmatically preparing for war. And they had a whole military strategy of what to do if Esav attacks them. Anyway, they met. The Zohar tells Yaakov off for waking up sleeping dogs. He shouldn't have gone via Esav and trying to make a peace treaty with him. You should know generally that according to Kabbalah and the Torah, generally we're more in a right of center position in terms of peace, meaning, of course we want peace, but you can't make peace with someone who wants to kill you, and therefore, very much, Yaakov Avinu is told off for trying to make peace with Esav because Esav wants to kill him. Then there's the next meeting. And this is the craziest meeting, and maybe Ellie's going to have a question about the angel. It says in the following verse, Ellie, it says the following verse. It says, ish imo. In fact, let's even go around. Let's even re reverse. Anyone know who Jacob has a fight with this week? Which angel? The one you shouldn't say. Very good. To be honest, you shouldn't say any angel's names. But you definitely shouldn't say this one. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spell it out. His name is S-A-M-A-E-L. Which is the angel of Esau. It's Esau's angel. It's Adolf Hitler's angel. It's Amalek's angel. It's Haman's angel. Who is Esau right now? Good question. Putin's trying to get into that position, it seems, but, but I don't know because the Arab world is definitely coming from Ishmael, but he has a fight with an angel. It says, there's literally a WWF fight going on. There's a wrestling match. It says they're wrestling. Crazy. Jacob's, this angel, Satan, literally attacks Jacob in this week's parasha. But just before he attacks him, do you know why he attacks him? And I was well, Jacob was with his family. Amazing thing, I'm going to teach you something crazy here. Jacob was with his family. And all of a sudden, Jacob's like, Shachachti <gasps> Masha, a bit like me when I leave the door every day, right? Darling, when I leave the door every day, I'm like, uh oh, when you get old like me, right? Just, you always forget something, so I had to go back. Jacob forgot something. Anyone know what he forgot? Shachach, Rashi says, Shachach Pachim Katanim. He forgot small jugs. I taught you something tonight. He forgot small drugs. What is that about? Because you forget small drugs on the other side of the river. He's now got to go in the middle of the night, on the dark, to the other side of the river, which he should have known, by the way, at Sadiq or Khatan and Kala, shouldn't be alone. Do you know that I'm going to give you a blessing now? You ready, everybody? All those of you in here are single. So I think it's everyone apart from my wife. All of you, Hashem should help you. Hashem. This year, marry your soulmate. And then the eve of your wedding... I want you to know the law. Don't, don't be, go by yourself in the streets of Tel Aviv. A chatan and kala, king and queen on their wedding day, big spiritual day, and we're susceptible, chas shalom, to being harmed by bad spirits, and therefore we don't go alone. Yaakov shouldn't have gone alone, but he went alone. Shut by, because he left, uh, as, if I left a few jugs, I would leave the few jugs. It's like, big deal. But it shows that there's something special about those jugs. Can anyone think what those jugs could have been? Coming up very soon. Oil. The jugs of oil. oil. Did Sadi Kim say, Sorry to Shmaid Zeh, Yaakov Abinu Shokach Pachim Pachim Katanim, Zay Apachim Katanim Shan Chanuka. Zem Hu Yada, the one day we're going to need these jugs of oil to do the miracle of Hanukkah. He saved the day then. He was a prophet. He knew what was coming, and those jugs of oil went down with the Jewish people and eventually. 1,500 years later, those jugs of oil were utilized in the Hanukkah miracle. He comes out of the jugs and all of a sudden, bang, Satan's on him, wrestling match, on the floor. Satan's trying to kill him. One of the greatest cabinets who ever lived is called the Leshem, the grandfather of Eliashev. He says, do you know what he was doing? It wasn't just like a physical fight. He was giving us a, a spiritual fight. Are you ready for this? I want you to not say it out loud, because please, I really don't want to hear. What is the biggest spiritual challenges you faced in Tel Aviv in the past. Please don't like shout about it. 
I just want you to think about what's the biggest spiritual challenges in your life you faced. The mystics say there was this crazy computer game going on where they were part of the program and, and Satan started tempting within Jacob's program every temptation. You know, every delicious piece of non-kosher meat, every beautiful girl that he shouldn't have gone with, any, any laziness, anger, jealousy, he threw it all. And Jacob's like warding them off. He's, he's good, he's good, he's winning, 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 winning. But there was one area that he hurt him. You know what that was? He hurt him over here in, in the thigh, the Gid Hanasheh, which is called the Gid Hanasheh. After the fight, even though Jacob won, he's now limping. He's limping around. Jacob's got a limp as a result. And so the morning, and then Hashem, by Yisrael HaShemesh, the sun made it better. What was the... Want to turn off the Bluetooth, guys? Turn off your Bluetooth, because then... Uh, otherwise, we're going to have the speaker on. So what happened? Listen to what the Shla Kadosh says... Ha- sorry, the, the Leshem says happened. He harmed... Him, over there in Kabbalah, I don't know if you know, I'm happy to send you something called the Ten Sfirot. In fact, our picture there, Rechob Alambi, we've kind of merged with the Ten Sfirot, those circles. Those circles are reality. Hashem channels to you, Shefa, through those Ten Sfirot the whole time. So, the lower, it's like in the body. So, it goes, <sighs> over here is Chochma bin Adat, Chesed, Gvura. Tiferes, Netzach, Hod, Yesod and Malchot. And therefore, in the Netzach, in Hod, is where he hurt him. Now, what does that mean? Let's go deep. How did he hurt us? So one obvious thing is near the sexual area, and that's why a lot of is Jewish men, that's one of the biggest downfalls, and that's what Bilam knew, and that's why Bilam used non-Jewish women to tempt the Jewish men, because that's one of a classic weakness that that he's got a hold over us, number one. Number two, in a Kabbalistic perspective, there's something going on in Netzach and Hod. Netzach Hod is actually where we have children, and it's the area of growth and the area of change. Says the Leshem the following. Esau kind of got into our personality. Esau managed to get in. He's now within us. There's a little bit of Esau in you. Our biggest enemy now ironically, isn't Hamas. It's, God forbid, the Hamas within us, which I'll explain what that means. According to Kabbalah, through our spiritual actions, we create decisions up high, and as a result of that, it comes down to earth. So if there was a war on Simchat Torah on the 7th of October, that's because within our inner world, something happened, not good, as a consequence, it was decided up there, now you've given strength to the angel of Hamas, to the angel of Ishmael, bang, all this is happening. Rabbi Nachman, one of my favorite Sadiqim, and I really recommend you read this story. I've actually got some of the books of the story here. He wrote down many stories. You know, it's funny, most people say that you read, Rabbi Nachman said, most people say a story to put someone to sleep. I say a story to keep you awake. And nowadays people like stories. I'm not gonna go through the whole story now. I tried to say one of Rabbi Nachman's stories to my, to my family a, a while ago and I got thrown out of the house because it was like going on and on and on. He has got very, very long stories. So I'm not going to go through the whole story now, but I think I'd like to do some classes of the stories. But in brief, very, very brief, here's a quick story. Rabbi Nachman has a story called The Exchange Princes. Here's the story. There was a king. And his wife was about to give birth at the same time as one of the, the ladies who work in the palace. And they're both going to give birth in the hospital at the same time. And this evil advisor wanted to see what would happen if he would swap the prince for the slave child and swap them at birth and no one will know. And let's do some side of science and experiment. Will the slave end up going back to being a slave? And will the prince go back to being a prince? In other words, is there something in in the nature of the prince and the slave, or is it all nurture and neither of them, neither of them will ever know? And that's what happens, says Rabbi Nachman. They came back from the hospital, and the king and the queen now had the slave child. And the slave had the prince. And Rabbi Nachman says, the whole life, 
the prince grew up as a slave, not knowing he was a prince. And the slave grew up as a prince, not knowing he was a slave. And Rabbi Nachman's got a whole long story, but in short, at different phases in the journey, the prince just feels that he doesn't belong to the slave world that he's in and feels that there's something more. And at a certain point, this drunk man told him when he was drinking one night that the truth is, you're a prince. And he got so devastated and angry, he had to go through the journey of now what does that mean? And a long story short, in the end, through different aspects of the kingdom, he comes back and he becomes, again, eventually he becomes the king. Says Rabbi Nachman, listen to this, we are all that. We are all that, meaning what? As a result of what Esau did to Yaakov, Esau's come inside us. And we're living a life, this hedonistic pleasure seeking life, where we think life's all about kef, fun, suntan, money, ego, power, domination. You know, one of the, I don't want to go into it too much now, one of the things I was thinking about, I would, the whole rape thing that went on on the 7th of October, how disgusting is that? And then, and then I saw some awful stuff on, on YouTube that these Muslim clerics are saying, we need to dominate the Jews. We rape because we want to dominate. And it, it just gave me a chill and a shiver. And tragically, that piece of Esau within us gives us all at times an awful evil thoughts of dominating. Like anytime if you want to dominate someone at work and you want to become the boss at work and you want to put them down, why do I see everywhere when I'm walking around people shouting at people, looking down at people, making fun of people? Maze, that's not our soul. It's because we don't realize who we are. It's because we think we're just like some E evolution of a monkey and monkeys don't have any morality so I don't need any morality and I'll make up my own morality and I'll just seek a pleasure seeking hedonistic lifestyle which is by the way what Hanukkah is what the Greeks tried to persuade us to go back to being slaves and unfortunately if we look at society most people some of the time don't realize who they are it says Rabbi Nachman like when, I, when you leave here tonight, I want you to think the following question. Who are you? Who are you? What is it that makes you you? What is it that, because your clothes, that's not you. We don't die with our clothes. You don't take your clothes with you. Your money, so many people are so attached to money. It's just Shelly, it's mine. Your identity is, I'm wealthy. The money's not you. When you die, you don't take your money with you. And by the way, in this time, you don't, often don't keep your money with you. It comes, it goes, it comes, it goes. So you're not your money, you're not your clothes. Who are you? You're your soul. And you're your spiritual morality. And you're, a, if you're part of Am Yisrael, you know, one of the most amazing moments of my life was this Shabbat. When miraculously, miraculously, last Tuesday, one of my students told me, let's go to Gaza and complete a Sefer Torah. The Rebbe from Lubavitch said, it will help Am Yisrael if you ever complete a Sefer Torah on a battlefield. So on Tuesday, we took JTRV and we took a bus to Gaza, as you do in a war, for the, the ceasefire. And I'm there, and at a certain point during the dancing of this amazing Torah celebration, I turned to the man who donated and said, And he said to me, I haven't decided yet. I said, whoa, I've decided. We need a Torah. Can we have it in 22 Aramby? And instead of what I thought he was going to say, he said, yeah. I went to Gaza and came back with the Torah. Very expensive, incredible, magical, 250,000 shekel Torah. So this Shabbat, when I made a bracha on that Torah, and I said the following line, Asher bachar vanu mikalu amim, that you've given us the merit of the whole world, the 0.4% of the world are Jewish, which by the way is mind-blowing. 15 million Jews are on the news every day. <laughs> Forever. 
And by the way, everyone's Jewish. Like, that journalist is Jewish, and that journalist is Jewish. And like, there can't be 15 million of us. Are you sure it's not 15 billion? How is that possible? That we're, the whole world is obsessed with us, and there's like a few of us. Have they not got a life? But, but there's something unique about the Jewish people. It's not better or worse, but we're exclusively being asked by Hashem to keep the 613 in its spot. My friends, this war is not about Israel. It's about that. It's about what Rabbi Nachman is saying. We've been asked to live in the palace. We've been asked to live a spiritual, moral, ethical life. To, to bring light to the world, to bring a higher consciousness to the world. That's our role, Ze'u. And the more we realize we're a soul, and the more we realize we come from Abraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Moshe, Aron, Davod, Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, that's who we are. Oh my gosh. It empowers you to want to do great things. It empowers you to say, I can change the world. I can make a difference in the world. I can bring so much light to the world. You know, there's this phrase we have in England, which is, I don't know why in England, we talk about American Jewish girls, we call them their Japs. Do you have me called a Jap? We've got a few Japs in the room? You know, and then the people in England, Jewish American princesses. In Israel, what do they call? Like, they don't have that. But I would call it a Jeep, right? You're a Jeep, right? You're a Jewish Israeli princess. And, you know, and, and the English are Japs. You're Jewish English princesses. And... And, and the French ones are JFPs, you know, Jewish French princesses. And, and, and if you, you know, they're right. We are. The women are princesses and, and, and the men are princes. And that's because it says in the Torah, I'm lechet kwanim. You're royal. The problem is we don't live that lifestyle. And the problem is now Isav's got into us. What are we going to do about it? So tonight I'm going to give you a few strategies how to defeat your Yetzirah, because my friends, it's a, it's a very powerful, profound thing to say, there's a little bit of Esav in all of us. As a result of that fight, he's got in, and now we have to get him out. Just before I go into that, the one last meeting in this week's parasha between Yaakov and Esav is at the end. It says Yaakov meets Esav in the following verse. It says, do you know what happened when they finally met? Anyone know? You would have thought Esau was like, I'm going to kill him. But the Bible says they embraced. We gave him a kiss. But what? Sorry? So, Rega. So, that kiss in the Torah, in our new, beautiful, amazing Sefer Torah. Thank you, Daniel. If you're watching, thank you. In our Sefer Torah, in every Sefer Torah around the world, that word, and he kissed him, has dots all around it. Do you know that, Eli? It's got dots all around it. Lama, why has it got dots? Why is there dots in the Torah? Why is there dots? Why is there dots? So the reason why there's dots, the reason why there's dots, is because whenever there's a dot around the Torah, it means don't read the word as you're meant to read it. So straight away, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says, it wasn't a kiss. The tradition Hashem told Moshe that was passed down, it was a bite. He went for a vampire bite. He went to try and kill it. And then, the Zohar says the scary line, which explains a bit of anti-Semitism. If you want to know, everyone's debating where does anti-Semitism come from. It's in this week's parasha. It says, Halachahi she'esav sonet Yaakov dan. My friends, there's a virus. There's a virus. It's called anti-Semitism. And at different times it comes out and it's not rational. They don't hate us because we're rich, because sometimes we're poor. And they don't hate us because we're poor, because sometimes we're rich. And they don't hate us because of Israel, because sometimes we don't have it. And they don't hate us because we're in their country, because sometimes now we're in our country, and they still don't like us. They hate us because they hate us. They don't even know why. It makes no sense. It makes no sense. But it's a halakha. Meaning it happens, a fact of life. Until Mashiach comes, there will be anti-Semitism. End of. But then there's an amazing twist. Because Rashi says there's another opinion, which is even more startling. Because the real, that's where you think. Esau's wicked, he wants to kill him, he tried to kill him. But there's another twist. What's the twist? It was a real kiss. It was a genuine kiss. For a moment, he did shuva. Do you know who Esau comes back as in a previous, in a future life? Anyone know? The Arizal says in Shah Gil which I've got over here, the book of reincarnation, which is a crazy book, which tells you who comes back as who. Do you know who he says Esau's come back as? Anyone know in here? 
So that's the bad stuff. He comes back once in a good way. He fulfills his potential. There's a staka box. That if you lose something, you put the money back. Who's that called? Rabbi Meir Balanes. Says that Riyad Kadosh, a Sabbat Sadiq, comes back and lives out the life of Meir Balanes. It's huge Sadiq. That was how he was meant to live. That was the part of him that kissed Yaakov sincerely. Meaning, any of you watch Star Wars? Any Star Wars fans? Any of them, because Darth Vader yeah. <laughs> is in all of them. And Darth Vader didn't have to be evil. We don't believe someone is born evil. As the Raman says in the laws of Shiva, no one is born good or evil. In fact, the more evil you are, the more good he could have been. Aesop could have been good. He chose bad. But he could have been good. Now let's understand how to defeat your Yitzhara. Here we go, there's a Mishnah, which says, there are three things that take you out of the world. Three of the biggest challenges we face. Anyone know? What are the three worst character traits that take us out of the world? Hakina. Do you know it? No, no, you're just thinking of, of, of um, spiritual mistakes. Or, but here's the thing, it says, Hakina, jealousy, envy, hata'ava, lust, fakavod, and ego, olam, remove you from the world, extract you from the world. I'd like to do something very deep with you now. According to Kabbalah, each one of them comes from one of the people in the Torah. Lavan, there's three types of anti-Semites. Here we go. There's three stat strands of this virus. Just like COVID was a certain strand. There's three strands. There's a strand called Lavan. Some say Lavan's the worst. Lavan is the worst. Because it says in the Haggadah, Lavan, Bikesh Lavan, La Garta Kol. He wanted to destroy everything. Judaism, Jewish people, Israel, everything. Lavan was a bad, bad, bad dude. Bad dude. Now, Lavan means the word white. What was Lavan's tactic? What's called intellectual dishonesty. Sometimes we're attacked. So, you know, me and Sam talk a lot about the matrix. Here we go. Within this matrix, this, the game is, Sam, um, that we have a lower self. We have a higher self. We're playing like a computer game within us the whole time. But that lower self has three really scary strands that we have to overcome. First one is the Lavan strand. Whenever we get attacked in our mind and our consciousness through intellectual dishonesty, it's fascinating. Sometimes the brain can be our worst friend. I'll give you an example. Most of the things we do, we do because we decide to do it. But we can be deluded into that by what's called this. I'll give you an example of intellectual dishonesty or a, a virus of anti-Semitism in Lavan. So I'm from England, so I see a lot of the social media on here from England. I'm sure in America they've got people who do this as well. The left wing in England are just saying the most terrible things on social media now. So there's this guy who's a good friend of Jeremy Corbyn, whose name is Owen Jones, who's a famous media personality in England who did something for me so disgusting that it made me think, Mamash Lavan. What did he do? He actually went to the screening of the 43 minutes of seeing the awful things that happened on the 7th of October. And he's one of the only journalists that came out, and you can look it up on YouTube, look up Owen Jones' YouTube. He gives his running commentary. And most people cry and are sickened and say it's terrible. What does the lovely Owen Jones do? He sits down and says, I didn't see any rapes. Everyone said there were rapes. I, I watched it all. There was no rapes. And then he actually scandalously says, you know, there was a woman with, with no clothes on, but just because she had no clothes doesn't mean she's raped. It's not sugar nut. You know, and then, and then he starts saying, I didn't see any beheadings. In other words, he used it to fit his narrative. And then, however bad that was, it's not a concentration camp. Gaza's a concentration camp. And he used that video to make the intellectual position that, that Hamas are the victims and Israel are the wicked aggressors. We're the Nazis. That is sick. That's an illness. But that's using the Lavan strand. That's using a immoral compass to try and persuade the world. And it's amazing on Twitter. If you just watch, you expect it. Most normal people to say, Owen, what are you doing? Are you mad? Owen, that's the best commentary I've seen on that. Owen, now you've made sense of it. 
Thousands and thousands and thousands of anti-Semites are loving Owen Jones now. He's like the poster boy for Hamas. And by the way, he's gay. And, 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 and someone, you know, sent him a, 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 a post of, by the way, this is what they'll do to you. And they showed him, a, they, they sent him a, a, a picture of, of Hamas throwing someone gay off a building. And they said, this is literally what they do to you. So you're a useful idiot. You know, you think you're helping them. They will kill you. And then he says, oh, you're a racist. So he just twists everything. He's the ultimate twister. And, and that's Laban. Laban means white. Whiter than white. There's amazingly, after October the 7th, still taking the moral high ground. You know, in England, they came out to demonstrate. Guess when? On October the 7th. And I was thinking, they're dememonstrating that we're still alive. We haven't even done anything yet. So what are they demonstrating? Is it like, there's still Jews alive? That can't be. That's not good. They would, don't give me the demonstration is because the way we're trying to get our hostages back. That's absolutely lies. That's lies. The demonstration is, we're anti-Semites. We don't want Jews. Hitler should have succeeded. That's, and they say that. They say that in the marches. I've got a friend of mine called Joseph Cohen who goes to the marches. They tell him that. That's Laban. Now, how does that apply to us? Because surely we don't have Laban. I've got news for you. We've all got Laban in us. I'll give you a few examples. A few examples. We rationalize our mistakes day in, day out. Even now, as I'm talking, if I'm saying things which could make you spiritually want to inspire, you're saying, oh, he's the rabbi, he would say that. That's just the rabbi, he's kind of an extreme radical. We're really not radical, I promise you. Right? And, 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 and there's all sorts of stuff, even now, going on in your head, which is kind of rationalizing your position for the status quo. You see, the Yetzirah wants you just to keep going. The Yetzirah just like... Don't get too lofty and let's just live for now, jam today. So anyone who's positing a different position, they're the extreme. Some of you could be thinking that now. So that's, that's Lavan. Lavan means, you know, another Lavan position that people come and say to me when I say to someone, hey, you know what? Slowly, slowly, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. It's, an, it's not all or nothing. It's not all or nothing. Judaism isn't all or nothing. Just do what you can do. You know, if someone wants to light Shabbat candles now, light Shabbat candles. What does Lavan in our brain say? One minute. If I light Shabbat candles, then I've got to do everything and everything and everything. And that's too much. In other words, sometimes the Yetzirah stops you even a little bit of growth through all sorts of tactics. That's the Lavan within us. That's one type of Lavan. But there's one much worse one, which I have to say is something that, that is a big struggle sometimes with me, which is the following. Lavan is so clever, sometimes he'll dress up as Yaakov. Sometimes he'll dress up as a Haredi. Sometimes he'll dress up and pretend. I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. When I came to Israel a year ago, like generally, I'm a big night person. Like I can go on for hours now. I'm cool. It's night. It's cool. I've got my coke. It's all good. You know, some of you, I can see you're suffering a bit because some of you wake up in the morning and that's when you've got strength. I never had strength until I came to Israel a year ago. And all of a sudden, for months, I was waking up at the crack of dawn. It's never happened in my life. I'm 52. And for 51 years, I would like, uh, I could wake up like it be really hard to wake up. All of a sudden, I'm waking up at 5.30, and I'm thinking, hmm, 5 o'clock, something's 4.30. And it was always before dawn. And I felt Hashem wanted me to go and pray sunrise. My father, near the end of his life, started davening sunrise, and I felt, hmm, I think that's what Hashem wants. But then there was a problem. I started doing sunrise. But then I was getting more tired in the day. And I'll never forget, because actually, if you look online, this time last week, this time last year, I said the following story, that, that the Wednesday of last year's share on this topic. I woke up and I did not know what to do. I literally did not know, because part of me was saying, you should get up, sunrise, very important to pray sunrise, good thing. On the other hand, I'm gonna be really tired for you guys. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna like not be able to teach. And I did not know what, I still to this day, when Lavan becomes what I call the from Yitzhara, the holy Yitzhara, when he's trying to push me to do things that I'm not ready for, that, that actually Hashem isn't expecting me now. 
That's, com- that's really hard to figure out what am I meant to do? Anyone ever experienced that? You know, when I went to Yeshiva, I, I had with this ambition, okay, you know, I read all these stories about these great people that they learned all night and they got up in the morning. So when I went to Yeshiva, I thought, you know, I'm going to be the last person out of the bedtime address at night and the first one in the morning. And for a while I did that. And then I got sick and then my body wasn't well enough to deal with it. So I was a right idiot. It's like, who was, I, I made a huge mistake. But my, I didn't know the, the, that sometimes the Yed Sahara can dress up asking you to do very holy things. It's tricky. So I'm going to give you the way to defeat Lavan, and it's the following. And this is what I want you to do. What happens with the wrestling match? Yaakov is, is meeting Esav, and, and Esav hits his Gedan Asher, and then Yaakov comes and is now on top of Satan, saying, I'm not going to let you go. Satan says, I've got to go because it's going to be Shacharis in heaven. I've got to go and pray. Sunrise. Ironically, Satan also prays sunrise. Because by the way, Ellie, when an angel goes upstairs, they're very from. Like, they come here, they've got a job to do, but then they go up and they want to serve Hashem. So Jacob said, because he had him in a headlock, and he said, mm, 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 I'm not letting you go until you give me a blessing. Give me a blessing. Anyone know what happened? So Satan said to Jacob, Mashmecha, what's your name? Yaakov said, Yaakov. Jacob said, the, the aim that Satan said, no more. From now on, you're going to be called, anyone know? Yisrael. Because Kisarisa Emelokim, you've now struggled with God. If any of you have ever struggled with religion, struggled with Hashem, good! You're meant to! That's what it means to be part of the Jewish people. We all wrestle with God. It's okay to wrestle, it's okay to struggle. That's what we are as Jews. That's what we mean by Yisrael. By the way, isn't that amazing? Am Yisrael Chai Yisrael is named by Satan. Go figure that. You didn't know that. Most people didn't know that. But then, Yaakov sees his chance to help all of us defeat our Yitzhahara and says to Satan, Tagidli, Mashmecha, what's your name? Do you know what Satan says? He doesn't say S-A-M-A-E-L. He says, Lama Zetishal Lishmi, why do you ask my name? Do you know what happened now? Let me ask you. Think up. You're Jacob. You're battering Satan. He wants to go and pray. He wants to go to be in Shul. You're not letting him go. And you say to him, what's your name? And he says to you, why do you ask my name? What would you do? Benny, what would you do? What would you say to him back? Tell me your name. Ronnie. Thank you. What would you say, Sam? Don't give me this political Joe Biden answer, like evading the point. Just give me your name, man. That's what you should have done. Do you know what he did? He said, okay, now you can go. He didn't ask for his name back. He said, okay, shalom. Shalom aleichem. See you later. Litraot. Why? Explain the Kabbalists. Listen to this. It's worth coming just for this moment. When Yaakov said to Satan, what's your name? And Satan says, Loma Zetishalash me. That is his name. Satan's name is, why do you ask my name? Satan's name is, look over there. Look over there. Satan's name is Owen Jones. Saying, oh, we don't see any rapes. There's no rapes. We're seeing Holocaust denial in real time, my friends. It's mad. But we're seeing it. And what you need to do if you want to win your own personal battle, which, by the way, is probably perhaps the most important thing you can do to help the Jewish people right now, because everything that happens in your own inner world causes a ripple effect in the higher world, which then changes the, back to this world. It goes down, up, down. If you can unmask your Yitzhara, when you have a voice in your head, for example, if there's a voice in your head which is saying, hmm... Let's say some of you were giving 20% charity. Halavai. You're giving 20% charity. And then the voice says, I should give another 5%. Work out, one minute, is that my higher self or lower self, really speaking? Because my monody says you shouldn't give more than 20% charity. 10 to 20. There's a famous story of someone who gave 50%. He lost everything and went to the rabbi complaining. The rabbi says, no one asked you to give 50%. 50%. That's down to you. The promise is you give between 10 and 20. It's never going to harm you. So sometimes we can be too from. Sometimes we can be not enough. But the first thing is, ask yourself, who's talking? 
Let's say you're going out with a girl and you really like her. But ask yourself, which part of me really likes her? Is it because she's gorgeous? Or is it because my soul is in love with her? Ask yourself, is it my ego, is it my soul? Is it my ego, is it my soul, is it my highest? Unmask yourself, work it out, trail it back. Find out the triggers, be honest with yourself. And one of the ways to do this is it says in the Mishnah, make your will Hashem's will. Ask, what do you think Hashem thinks? What is the right thing? What is the right thing? So let's say you're going out with a girl. And physically it's amazing, there's crazy chemistry. But you're not good for each other. You're not bringing the best out of each other. So then, normally in those cases, Hashem would be saying, that's not the one. But how many people, but it's so much fun, and da da da, and they continue because your lower self wants it, and that's the mistake. We need to unmask our voices, understand our triggers, work out who we are. One way to do that is to learn actually how to talk to the Yitzhara. This is crazy. There's a famous story of the Kaddish's lady, one of my favorites, Lady Yitzhak of the One day, he's in synagogue, and there's something about Shabbat Mincha, where the Kabbalist of the synagogue is the one that raises the Torah. So he's on his way to raise the Torah, and all of a sudden, they see the rabbi having a fight with his talit, which, by the way, is very unusual. And he's saying to the talit, if you want to do it so much, you do hagba. And he threw the talit down, he walked out the shore. And everyone thought he'd gone totally mad. And afterwards, the student said that, to the rabbi, what was, why are you talking to your talit? And he said, okay, I'll tell you. He said, I was about to go and do hagba. And all of a sudden, my Yitzhara started saying, psh, psh. only you, the ones who can see the lights of the Torah. It says that the Orot on the Sefer Torah shine very brightly in Shabbat Mincha, more than any time in the week. And his Yitzhara was telling him, do you realize how great you are? So then he said to his Yitzhara, if you want it so much, you go and do it. And he separated himself from his Yitzhara. We have to learn, sometimes through communication, to almost disconnect ourselves, work out who's our Yitzhara, who is ours. I wish I could do that with food. Oh my gosh. Can you imagine? You're like, you're really hungry for something which is really bad for you. And you say to your Yitzhara, if you want it, you go and eat it. Problem is, I'll say, you go and eat it. And I'm just like, I, I, I'll just be following the Yitzhara in. That's the problem. This becomes, we become consumed with the Yitzhara, but that's issue. So what we're saying is, a tactic is to unveil it, to ask it, to work it out. I'll give you a radical suggestion now. This is crazy. You ready for this radical suggestion? So, well, probably, if, I, if you were to ask me what's the most important verse in the Bible, let me ask you, what do you think? The most important verse in the Bible. I mean, in the beginning, pretty important. Okay. So in the beginning, pretty important, because especially in Kabbalah, everything's rooted in that. But I wouldn't say that one. For me, just me personally, it's very subjective. There's no right and wrong answer. Apart from Rabbi Kiva. Rabbi Kiva says there is a right and wrong answer. Darling, what will be for you? Very nice. Oh, we're really good ones tonight. Hero Israel, that's the thing that we say. A lot of, a lot of survivors of, September, of, of October 7th were saying when they were driving very fast past the terrorists, they literally put their heads down saying, Shema Yisrael. It's amazing how Jewish people, however religious we are or not, we just go back to our mantra. The Dalai Lama once famously told one of my friends when he asked for a mantra from him, he goes, you're Jewish, your mantra is Shema Yisrael. So that is our mantra. You're the nice one of the heart of a chayim. My one is the following. Chapter 19 in Leviticus, verse 18. Lerecha kamocha. You should love your friend like you love yourself. I mean, that's what religion is. That's what spirituality is. If you've got someone who does a lot of so-called spiritual things, but isn't a nice person. It's not even to talk about mother. You're not religious. That's why Derech Eretz Kadmala Torah. Before you can learn Torah, before you can keep Shabbat, you should be a nice person. Otherwise, you've got a vessel which is full of ego, which the light can't get in. So, be, so listen to this. For your hafta l'rei acha. So we have my Israeli friend over here. What's the root of l'rei acha? You have to l'rei acha. Huh? You should love Sumaza Re'acha. Re'a is a friend. Re'ut is friendship. 
You should love your friend. According to Kabbalah, there's another Hebrew word in the word re'a, which is just ra, resh ayin. You should love the evil in you. What does that mean to love the evil in you? Now, please don't misunderstand me, but it means like this. Says the Kotzka Rebbe, one of the ways to defeat your Yitzhahara is sometimes not to fight. On the contrary, sometimes to really look after your body, to care for yourself, not to repress yourself. That's why one of the most important things in the Torah is to take care of your body. We learned it before. That's why to love yourself. I'm a life coach and I've got a few sessions going if anyone wants. So as a life coach, I teach people the importance of self-love. Because you can't be good to anyone if there's no self-love. The Haftal Reacha means don't if you where Judaism is different to other systems, let's say you have a, a desire. We believe there's a kosher way to use, utilize that desire. It's not like we have to ban our desires. We're not, to, we're not like Christians where we're, we're monks and let's abstain and let's like go and meditate on a rooftop for 17 years. Which Jew does that? Which Jew doesn't have food like every day the whole day? You know, which Jew doesn't have lots of drinks? We're, every desire, there's a time and a place. And actually not to repress yourself. So I had a friend of mine who when I start him, taught, started taught, teaching him Torah, he says, Rabbi, I think I can even do Shabbat, but kosher, I love non-kosher food too much. Like, I need my non-kosher food. Like, like, you've never, he said to me, I'll never forget it. You don't know what it's like. <laughs> you just don't know what it's like. You never tasted it. So you're a rabbi, what do you know? So I said to him, do you know what Hashem wants you to do for growth? First and foremost, slowly, slowly, Find the nicest kosher restaurant. And gold is green. We like kaifang or mitsuyan or the best meat. And, and, and if you like food so much, so Hashem wants you to have food. So have fantastic food. Indulge. Just halabai. In other words, the answer isn't to give it, to like repress ourselves from our desires. First of all, you know, love yourself and even love you and love who you are. And if you have desires for things, that's okay. Embrace you. Accept you. But just do things in a kosher way. So that's the Laban. Next, Yishmael. Yishmael is one of the other big villains. The Mishnah said, Hata'ava. Yishmael's biggest weakness is, is you know, when they want, and Hashem said to Yishmael, do you want the Torah? They said, What's written in it? Hashem said, Lot ignored, don't steal. And they said, it's not for me. Yishmael don't know how to control boundaries, according to Kabbalah. They are, we, we call kindness gone wrong, says Rabbi Desla. They don't have boundaries. So I've got news for you. Next time you're dealing with your Yishmael in you, next time you have lusts which you can't control, lusts which are unbearable, the way to succeed is, first of all, chill. Relax, listen to the voice. If you really know that it's wrong, you shouldn't be doing it, it's the Ishmael in you, and say, okay, time for some boundaries. Start learning. But not even in that area. Sometimes it's too hard to like, deal with the direct issue. Go a little bit cleverly. And like anything to do with boundaries is a good thing. You know, let's just say, you know, for you, a lot of guys have said to me, Rabbi, you know, to be single, how can I, you know, stay celibate till I'm married. Well, first of all, you can come here on a Monday night, get, get, get a girl, get a girl, and get married very soon, and then all good, right? But even, let's say, until you do, one of the ways to deal with it isn't to deal with that, it's to, to learn to have boundaries in other areas. For example, Shmirat HaLashon. How many of us really have control over what we say? Do we think before we speak? Think before we speak. Anything to do with Shmirat, Something called Shmirat Einayim, be careful what we watch. Not to be jealous of other people. Learning to kind of begin to have some spiritual control in us. That will be a way to combat the Ishmael in us. And finally, the worst of all, the Esav in us. Let me finally and conclude with this. How to defeat the Esav in us. So the Talmud in Sukkah, page 52 says the following, a savinaz is when our ego is uncontrollable. And by the way, when I look around at the world, I do think this is the biggest issue. I think many of the issues come from ego. 
Even let's say someone has an affair, it's coming from the perspective, I'll do what I want. I ask my, I'll do what I want. I'll do what I want. Just because you're married, you know, I'll do what I want. You know, when the Hamas wicked terrorists had the chutzpah to go into our fridges and take out some drinks, and that's beyond, it's basically coming from the perspective of, I'll do what I want and, and I'll do what I want. I'll take whatever, I'll take everything. So when the Esau within us gets to this, Place. The first thing, my friends, is what Jacob did when he met Esau. Do you know what he did? He bowed down seven times. Now you might ask, is Jacob crazy? Why are you bowing to your arch rival? Can you imagine? Netanyahu meets Hamas leader and Netanyahu bows down. We'd be furious with him. You know, the, the right wing on the government would leave in a second. You bow down to them? But Jacob was very clever. Because he said he understood that whatever happens in the physical world, happening in the spiritual world. When you humble yourself... You know, I gave you a story last week. It was the Yotzah, the Bat Ayin. great Kabbalist, the Bat Ayin lives in Sfat. There was an earthquake. It killed 80% of the Jewish community. But the Bat Ayin, this great Kabbalist, went by his Arana Kodesh and he bowed down. When a Kabbalist bows down, they are making themselves null and void. They are nullifying their ego. They are nullifying the eye. They're, they literally, the ego dissipates. There's nothing there. And then the Bat Ayin said, okay, everybody now, we're safe here. Come. And all the people that came to him by the ark, it was fine. In fact, that, that part of the synagogue still exists in Tzfat. A miracle. A miracle. You can go to Tzfat right now and you'll see one of the only remaining synagogues from the earthquake was the Batites. Because of humility. So Jacob bowed down. It says he bowed down seven times, which is connecting to the seven spirot. Again, that picture there has the spirot. He's going through each spirot and getting rid of the ego of each one. Humility, my friends. You know, what's the first two words we're meant to say in the morning? Modeh ani. Isn't that interesting? Grammatically, that makes no sense. It should say ani modeh. You say ani modeh. Ani modeh lecha. It doesn't mean modeh ani. Modeh ani. Makes no sense. The mystics say it makes perfect sense. Hashem is saying when you wake up in the morning, the first thing you need to do, don't say I. You want to say I, don't say I. You want to say ani, just modeh. Start with gratitude. Start with modeh, and then the ani, and now you have a beautiful day. You want to get rid of your esav? Get into humility, number one. And finally, says the Talmud, this, mashcheu beta medrash. When we're learning Torah properly, when you're really absorbed, there's no space for esav to get in. You become one with Hashem. You become aligned with Hashem. That's why it says, Talmud Torah, can I get kulam? And try it. Next time, like your Yitzhahara is going off on one, just open a book. Start learning. And if within two minutes, if you're still learning, sago. One last school up. It says, the Yaakov did. Let's see if I can remember it. It said, Vayishlach Yaakov Malachim Lefanav. Lefanav, I think, is the Gematria 136. Because there's 136 verses in Tehillim Kuf Yud Tet. The mystics explain, he said to Tehillim 119, one tactic to really nullify or Yitzhara is to hit him 119. It does something very powerful. And therefore, those three tactics, number one, humility. Number two, learning Torah. Number three, to hit him, by the way, to him, Kufiotet is the longest one of all. I can assure you, you start saying it and keep going, the Yitzhara can't be bothered to stay. The Yitzhara's like, ah, oh, fine. I'll come back tomorrow because it's so long, Kufiotet. So they say Kufiotet is big. And Rizrat Hashem, in merit of what we've spoken about tonight, we've learned so how to combat the Lavan in us, the Ishmael in us, the Esav in us. When we do that in our inner world, it takes them out in the higher world, which properly takes them out in the lower world. That's when there's Shalom. That's when there's peace. That's when there's redemption. Bezrat Hashem, Bezchut, the Limut Torah we've done tonight in Tel Aviv, in Atzein al there should be Shalom. All the Chatobim should come back safely. The Chayalim should be protected, Hashem. All of Amisar should be protected. And we shouldn't have to suffer anymore. Thank you for coming, everyone. Thank you.